Hello, everybody, and thank you ever so much for joining us, and uh, particularly some of you who are um, joining us at challenging times of the day. Um, we're here today to talk about um, the proposed changes um, or, or the consultation about possible changes to the way in which the Archbishop of Canterbury is selected. Um, the Archbishop's Council has put out a consultation document. Um, reply is open until the end of March. And the suggestion is that the Anglican Communion is given a greater say in choosing who the next Archbishop of Canterbury is. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury's roles um, are very many, but um, as well as being head of the um, Church of England, he's also the spiritual leader of um, 85 million Anglicans worldwide in 165 countries. Um, so this proposal hasn't come completely out of the blue in the sense that um, the initial idea from it came from the Diocese of Canterbury itself in 2015. But the Archbishop's Council has now been giving it some thought and has produced this consultation document. Um, Ian Paul's with us today. He is a member of the Archbishop's Council. He's not speaking on their behalf. He's speaking in a personal capacity. Um, but Ian, if I could start um, by asking you, it, it's clear, isn't it, that the Archbishop's Council is minded that there should be some sort of change in the way uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is selected? I'm not entirely sure it's fair to say the Archbishop's Council is minded on anything uh, in the sense that um, we... <laughs> Well, we, we, we have a diverse range of views in the council, but but also um, this hasn't really come from us. It's come through us uh, in the sense that, as you, as you mentioned, it is generated by, I mean, quite interesting. I'm not in Canterbury Diocese. I'd love to know the dynamic there. It's been generated by uh, a diocesan motion. So there's a sense in which they passed the ball to us and then we very quickly passed it on in, in terms of um, saying, look, we ought to have this consultation. And the reason is that I think there are a number of I don't know if you want me to go now into sort of some of the issues around around the around. Well, the so just let inform us a little bit about some of the thinking, because obviously you then did some thinking in the light of what Diocese Canterbury had said. Yeah. So what what were the what were the things that were informing your thinking? Well, the first one, the most obvious thing, is that Justin Welby is due to retire within the next certainly four years, and that's going to be very significant in the sense that he's actually going to retire before the end of this quinquennium of synod. So, the whole process of appointing the next Archbishop of Canterbury is going to be fraught with issues. I think it's going to be highly contested. I think the second thing which is quite interesting is that Justin put a lot more effort into building relationships in the, in the communion than Rowan Williams ever did. My understanding is that Rowan Williams visited around the communion when he was invited and didn't go to that many provinces. Justin actually made a point of visiting every single province of the communion in his first year, which is part of the reason why I think he's so exhausted. Um, and it, it feeds into some of the complex dynamics of how the communion relates to one another. Uh, some of the negative responses have been around the idea that uh, that this appears to be presuming that the Archbishop of Canterbury sort of functions as a mini pope in the communion. Uh, and other, some have pointed out that the communion itself is simply an association of member churches, largely bound together by mutual respect, recognition of sacraments, interchangeability of ministerial orders. And again, I think it's very easy, particularly in the secular press, to think that bishops are CEOs in their diocese, therefore that archbishops are sort of CEOs of CEOs, therefore the Archbishop of Canterbury is sort of a CEO of the CEO of all the provinces in the communion and they have to do what he says. And of course, the reality is nothing like that at all. It really is about a voluntary association. And that's why it's important that we do go back to this, this expression of the role of the archbishop as being primus inter pares. He is first amongst equals. And particularly in the tensions around the communion and the debates on sexuality, the members of the communion are very, very clear that the Archbishop of Canterbury does not tell them what to do. But it's complicated, isn't it? Because he is the head of the Church of England. And as such, he's got a, a, a state role. Um, Parliament uh, you know, approves um, his nomination. And yeah. therefore, presumably, um, Parliament would have to approve any change that was, was recommended um, by Synod. Um, so it, it's, it's messy, isn't it? It is, except that um, we've now moved into an era of convention, a little bit alongside the fact that, you know, technically speaking, it's the Queen who appoints the government. Um, but we know that she has a nominal role in that now, and, and convention has been for a long time, she doesn't interfere. And there's been parallel developments with the Church of England in relation to Parliament as well. 
I'm, I'm going to leave um, you there for now, Ian. Thank you yeah, very okay. much for that. Um, the, the suggestion um, coming is that the representation of um, Anglican communion representatives on the CNC increases from one till five. Um, not clear. One of the questions in the consultation document is whether this these representatives should be a combination of primates, clergy and laity. Um, and they should be from uh, five Anglican provinces. Um, now, I'm delighted that uh, Bishop Joseph Wondera from Kenya, the Mamias Diocese, is here sitting outside in the heat somewhere. Um, we can but dream. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us, um, Bishop Joseph. Um, I wonder, what are your initial, what's your initial response to the idea that Anglican communion have a greater say in choosing the Archbishop of Canterbury? Well, thank you for having me in this conversation. Um, it would be uh, a wonderful idea uh, if uh, it was possible that uh, uh, those to choose the next archbishop, um, the pool is widened, are uh, coming from, uh, from Africa, uh, from East Africa, from Kenya. We, we look at the Archbishop of Canterbury as a centerpiece for unity. And we always look forward whenever he visits. We, 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 look, uh, we, we look to him really as our, as our first among the elders. And we, 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 we take seriously his pronouncements uh, on, on matters of the Anglican family. And, and I use the word family deliberately uh, that we are not just a church uh, um, in the United Kingdom uh, or in Kenya, we are a global family uh, that is quite large. And so therefore any discussion around uh, how uh, our head is chosen uh, is of interest. And it would be very, very good uh, if it was made more participatory. However, and I say, however, we also reckon uh, with the fact that uh, the choice of uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is embedded in a long history and so, uh, 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 again, maybe we need to reimagine and, and, and should we envisage uh, a rotational uh, reality where, where the Archbishop of Canterbury is, is, is rotating around the, around the communion. Now, the, 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 these are dilemmas because as, as it is, it's, it's very much embedded um, um, in British history, uh, perhaps global history as well. And we, we, we really, the, 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 the main players, the, the, the main parties are, 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 are in England, uh, uh, so to speak. Can I ask uh, you, now, Bishop, yeah. sorry for interrupting. Um, can I ask you, when the Archbishop of Canterbury shows up um, in, in Kenya, um, how do... Uh, Anglicans respond. I mean, the, the church-going Anglicans are they? Do they do they see him as a significant person? Are they welcoming of him? Are they delighted he's there? Whenever he visits, it, it attracts a lot of interest, not just from Anglicans, but even from other uh, re religious groups. Um, but speaking about Anglicans, we 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 love him. We we, we look we, we look to him as as our elder. Uh, we, we, we take his positions on, 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 on doctrine, uh, on global events very, very seriously. And, and, and whenever he visits uh, uh, bishops and, 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 and archbishops would stop everything else to go and, 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 and welcome him because we, we really look to him as, 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 as the first among equals, as I've said. Right, but there is this um, suggestion um, that, that perhaps the head of the Anglican Communion, if, if not the Archbishop of Canterbury, might be a sort of rotating role. I suppose what would be lost if that happened and that it wasn't the Archbishop of Canterbury who was the head of the Anglican Communion, it was um, a primate from another part of, of the Communion for a five-year term. I mean, what would be lost if you didn't have that sort of... Um, if anything, that, that sort of connection with what historically has been the sort of mother church in England? Well, for me, where I sit in a little village in Africa, nothing would be lost. It, it would just be that things have changed and that we, we now have to train ourselves to look at a different center. 
So the, the center would now not be Canterbury. The, the, the center might be Nairobi, Kenya. Yeah. The, 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 the center might be Kampala, Uganda, or it might be Cape Town, South Africa. And I, I suppose, uh, I think we need to be courageous to envisage that kind of, 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 of reality. It, 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 it would be, so to speak, some, some kind of decolonization process taking place and us being able to say that, well, let's now come and share on the table equally. Uh, but, but again, there are sensibilities around that, I think in the British context, I can imagine. And so I would say that uh, where, wherever, whoever, let it be somebody who has the, the ability to reimagine the communion and, and somebody who is empathetic to the new issues around the Anglican family. And there are many issues, uh, poverty in Africa, uh, human trafficking, climate change, which affects the greater uh, uh, percentage of Anglicans who are really from poor countries. So it should be somebody who has those kind of feelings and not somebody who is up there in the ivory tower, uh, not, 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 not able to understand the, the, the various dynamics in the communion as it were. Thank you so much. I think that um, the, the um, consultation document itself would say there are huge questions that, that it isn't our place to sort of um, decide. It's for the Anglican Communion in a way to decide um, where the, the, the leadership lies, but that this is, this is some sort of small step towards sort of opening up um, this discussion. Um, Simon Sarmiento, you're the founder of the blog Thinking Anglicans. I, I want to ask you about the implications of something like this for the Church of England? I'm not in favour of this particular proposal. Let me just start from that point. Um, but before I answer your question, can I just explain that one of the, never mind the details of the proposal, how many people, where they come from, all the rest of it. I think it's not at all clear what question the proposal is trying to answer. Um, I think the points that have been made, for example, in the Church Times by James Walters in his article about a rotating presidency is identifying a much more important underlying problem, which is how should the Anglican community itself be organised? Organisation is a difficult word to use in connection with the community because it, there's one thing that's general about it is, is that it's mostly not organised. But... Um, I do think it's very odd that this proposal has come uh, in the way that it has. Um, and, and I don't think it's helpful to the Church of England to be seen, as it will inevitably, I think, be seen, as making colonial type proposals from England to the communion. The way to get any change in this whole area is surely for the instruments of the communion, and I would in this case presume it would be the Anglican Consultative Council to make a proposal to the Church of England rather than vice versa. I just wonder if I could come to Reverend Dr. Evie Vernon. Um, we're going, going back to thinking about the Anglican communion a bit now, and then we'll come back to the Church of England. And uh, right. But um, you're the former theological advisor to uh, the mission organisation, USPG. And I, I just wonder whether um, what the bishop was saying about how the Archbishop of Canterbury is, is perceived. Um, I wonder if that rings true with parts of the communion with which you are most familiar. I'm thinking of Jamaica in particular. I mean, how does the how does is the Archbishop of Canterbury perceived there? Well, if if thought about at all, um, okay, this is it, it's been very interesting, and there is a way in which in many parts of the communion, all of is kind of the bishops are interested. I don't know how much the people on the ground are particularly interested. And you're talking about two things, yes? Mm -hmm. The Archbishop of Canterbury as a British primate, you know, the primate of all England. Um, and how that plays in when this bishop visits, this Archbishop visits as an English, at the moment, man. Um, and 
and that perception that the weight of colonialism there and the, the issue of, well, um, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really stuttering back and forth. But it's in, in Jamaica, really, of course, you can get up a crowd if the Archbishop of Canterbury comes. Is anybody? But does it make a difference? How is he perceived? A nice visiting gentleman. Um, they might be naughty to say it. They were kind of more interested when um, Archbishop St. Amu came as, you know, a more interesting look at the Church of England. So if they, if they have the primate from another part of the communion, if the um, Archbishop of Nigeria was the primate, for example, they would be every bit as, as interested. Absolutely. When Arch and Archbishop Tutu coming, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. A yeah. bigger deal. I like the, even when I was a young um, theological student way back in the last century, the notion of decoupling the primacy, okay, from the from Canterbury and the colonial weight of that was something that seemed really interesting and a cogent argument. Let us indeed think of having um, the center of the Anglican communion moving around in Kingston, in Cape Town. You know, what would that look like? What would that, that, I think that would be, bring some real energy. And would you lose anything as you asked? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just um, to, to bat it back to what, um, what an increased Anglican communion voice in the selection of the Archbishop might mean for the Church of England. I mean, we all know that the communion has a very um, diverse views on any number of issues, um, human sexuality being the, the um, most uh, dominant. Um, and indeed the role of um, women uh, and uh, the appointment of women bishops or not. Um, I mean, Sally Barnes, you're... Um, a long-time observer of um, the place of women in the Church of England. Um, and I, I wonder, I mean, whether you have concerns about what the implications for this might be for the Church of England and the advancement of women within the Church of England. Thank you, Rosie, yes. Um, I'm very new to this group and also new to the idea, as most of us are, about a wider representation of choice. But the thing that hit me very much with what about the women? Um, we have some very, very good women bishops now who too sprang to mind immediately. But how would this be accepted in the Church of England with other denominations, with other um, countries? Um, we, it, it's a very difficult and interesting uh, debate. Um, that that was mostly my my thinking about it. Who is actually going to? I had twelve questions I asked myself when I was hearing about this, um, and one of them was the whole process of how are you going to select the people you're going to choose from? Who's going to select them? Um, who's going to reach out to the people to say I would really rather like this person because. Um, how far is that going to go? Down to the parishes, perhaps? Everywhere? I don't know. I haven't read that bit. But the whole question of women, um, a woman Archbishop of Canterbury, to me, would be obviously excellent with the qualities of, that some of our women have, um, who could do it really well. But the difficulties for them, I think, are so great. It's bad enough in England. I don't know what... It, you know, um, what people feel about that. I mean, it may, I mean, one, the, there is a range of um, views, obviously, from other parts of the Anglican Communion yes. on whether um, it would be appropriate to have a, a woman as the Archbishop of Canterbury. And I guess with five people, even if they all um, agreed, um, which is questionable, if they all agreed that they, they it, it wasn't um, theologically acceptable to have an Archbishop of Canterbury, they could still um, be outvoted if the the rest of the um, commission had a mind to appoint a particular um, woman to the role. Um, 
but yes there is that there is that question isn't there about um, whether happened, if that happened you know yeah. how would that be handled can you imagine um <laughs> Charlie Bell, you're you're waking up. Are you in a hotel room in New York or somewhere in New York? Um, thank you for being with us. T tell me about what you, your um, reservations are about these proposals in terms of um, the polity of the Church of England. Thanks. Yes, sorry. Um, I do always promise myself I won't do any work abroad and always fail in that. So there we are. Um, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, we won't call it work and then it'll be fine. So I, I think so. Um, my first, I, I just wanted to very briefly say, you know, I know it, it, this isn't being um, played as entirely about the Canterbury motion, but I do think that point matters. The Canterbury motion in, is not really the spring from which this comes. Um, it's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. And I think we need to be serious about uh, if, if churches or if dioceses in the Church of England are asking for particular things from the Archbishop's Council, there should be more transparency about what that actually is that's being asked. This, I think, um, frankly, the proposal, I don't think will get past a governance committee, even if it's looking at a reasonable set of questions. For me, I have a big question about how the, the members of the different um, communion uh, groups would be selected. And indeed, I'm intrigued as to how the different groups of the communion have been uh, selected in the document. This doesn't follow any uh, normal uh, primatial uh, map. It doesn't seem to follow anything by what we, the way we would normally um, uh, uh, select or elect people from the communion into representative positions. So I'm really bemused by that. And I'm bemused by the fact that Wales and Scotland would be explicitly rejected and removed from any kind of elect election uh, position. So they wouldn't be represented in this, which for me just seems like a very bizarre way forward. Um, I, we've heard a lot sensible about um, the possibility of a rotating presidency. Um, I think what we've also heard is how extremely complicated this issue is. Um, we've we've heard about the the um, having five members on the committee, but all they would really be there is as an in a nominal position. And we hear that as a kind of positive that well, you know, well, even if if it didn't go well, at least they could still be outvoted, as though that's something that should be something that's attractive to us. If we want to make a change, a serious fundamental change in this way, then we need to um, then we need to to be thinking about. Uh, having a, a, a deciding factor amongst the communion, if that's what we're wanting to do. What we shouldn't be doing is uh, is is window dressing, which is inviting people into the room, but then being able to outvote them anyway. That mm. for me is is just just nonsense. Um, and, and I think also, I mean, there are clearly serious issues of colonialism uh, in the history of the Anglican communion and in its current structures. Um, and yet we, were, we are trying to tinker around with um, who we would appoint as an English bishop. Um, for me, and who would remain, and that the paper makes it very clear, is the leader of the Anglican Communion. Newish terminology, terminology which I think should be rejected, um, but nonetheless, uh, terminology that's within that documentation. So for me, this is this is very, very, there's a much, much bigger issues than who uh, is on the CNC, who's on the electing body. We haven't addressed the issues of uh, colonialism. We haven't addressed the underlying tensions and dynamics within the Communion. Um, and we know that having a, a woman Archbishop of Canterbury under the current um, uh, 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 organisational uh, structures would be extremely difficult. We haven't gone there. We haven't looked at the financial differences between different parts of the communion and how that interplays into the dynamics. You know, for me, this if we're going to go down this route um, about trying to decolonize the Anglican communion, which I think we should, we need to have a very serious think about what we think the communion is, how we see each other, exactly as Bishop Joseph described, as do we see each other as uh, others as family? Do we see each other as um, policymakers? Do we see each other as a pain? Um, the other side of the world. How do we see each other and how then do we direct and, and organise our structures? The consultation um, sort of said, you know, we, we, we have to start somewhere and this is a sort of tentative step and sort of acknowledge that it was opening possibly um, much wider areas of discussion by making the step. But you think that maybe they should have been brave and bold and said, right, let, let's talk about the whole, the whole way, the whole role of the... Anglican Communion, the whole role of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this makes any change, uh, any any um, sort of radical change. Well, not not any change at all, really. I mean, it it moves people in in a very bizarre structural sense uh, to the centre of decision making without giving them any real decision 
taking power. Um, it, it brings them in from um, a group of different places which don't reflect the Anglican Communion in its in any normative sense in the way that we'd normally vote for people or have them selected. And then, but I also don't think that this actually addresses the underlying issue. What it does is is uh, is essentially look good because it looks like we're bringing people in, but I don't think it addresses the underlying dynamics that we need to address. And for me, this is if we're going to do a huge structural change, we need to start to doing structural change in the context of understanding that we do not agree on really fundamental issues across the communion. Can I ask you to re respond to that, to what, what Charlie's just said? Yeah, uh, I, I think I entirely agree with him that th th there are a number of um, inequalities in our Anglican family, um, even uh, but even though there are these inequalities, we are still family, and and we need to we need to thrash out these issues. Um, those of us who come from the southern hemisphere, uh, even though we cherish uh, the role that the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, plays in our family, and even though we look at our brothers and sisters across the globe as part of us. We, we also lament, we also lament at, at, at the different challenges that we face, the, 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 the various challenges that we face as part of the, of, of, of the Anglican family. And sometimes we feel that perhaps uh, the others have moved on and that these issues are non-issues to them. And they have left that we, we stand on our own and we struggle on our own. So all those issues, uh, my brother has enumerated as uh, are real issues that need to be uh, worked out uh, slowly by slowly uh, so that we, 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 we reach to a point where we can actually say, well, uh, we, there, there's now a common brotherhood and sisterhood and that we can journey together uh, as it were. Thank you. I mean, it's um, if there are to be any changes, they're going to be discussed by the Church of England's General Synod in July. Um, I don't know if the timing of that is deliberate because of the the Lambeth conference, um, but as you know, as you reflect, you know the, the communion is divided on on many issues. Um, I believe your own primate isn't coming to the Lambeth conference. I don't know if if you're coming, Bishop um, Joseph, or not. Um, oh, oh yes, I will be. I will be at Lambeth, be God willing. Yeah. If if, um, I, if I'm given the visa. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there is also the politics of visas, as you know. Yeah, um, but um, but Andrew Symes, um, you're from um, Anglican mainstream. You're in contact with a, a lot of the um, primates from the global south and bishops from the global south who um, are not coming to Lambeth, who feel that um, the communion is hopelessly divided over the issue of, of human sexuality. Are you picking up what what soundings are you picking up from people that you're speaking to? Hi everyone. Yes, I. I, I think um, this, from, from, from the point of view of one or two soundings I've made, um, most people think it's a good idea to have more representation on the committee which selects the, the Archbishop, and it, it's, it's just an in, it, it increasing the number of voices. I don't think, I mean, I, I hear what Charlie says, but I don't think it is window dressing. I think um, to have five people out of 17 rather than one out of 16 is a significant Difference and it does mean a, a wider range of views would be held, and also the perspective of the global south would be there in a much in a much more real way. Even though the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, as has been said, is a you know is an English um, role primarily, uh, uh, and and so the majority of people there would be from England. So um, you know I, I I I hear what's said about window dressing, and and I think another thing which I've heard actually someone said to me. Uh, as I was sounding out the views that, um, you know, looking at it more negatively, that whatever is decided, um, it will not make any difference because the process will just be stitched up by the same sort of people talking in back rooms from the from the establishment. Um, now, you know, that's a, perhaps a cynical view, but we all recognise that. And um, I see in one of the chat, someone mentioned uh, uh, about the episode from Yes, from Yes Minister. Um, about how bishops are selected. So that's part of it as well. But I, I would want to say this, that um, one of the things that comes across very strongly 
um, is uh, uh, from a, a large section of the global south is they want an archbishop who they feel uh, shares and articulates the same faith that they have. And we've alluded to the big differences that there are across the communion and even within the Church of England um, on this issue. It's not actually just about sexuality. There are underlying um, theological and philosophical views that underlie different views on sexuality. Um, and there are lots of people across the communion who want an archbishop who believes and articulates what they've always held to be um, the faith once delivered to the saints. Um, and I think also, you know, GAFCON is sometimes portrayed as a, as a very sort of harsh organization uh, and so on. And, and we, can, we can talk about that, but I think it's worth recognizing that for many people in the Global South, one of the motivations for GAFCON has been a sense of being told what to do by the West um, on issues of morality and family and so on. And, and that is part of the legacy of colonialism. That's how it's perceived. Um, so I, I think it's worth putting that in as well and Can how that voice is, is important to be heard. Yeah, just before, um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, I just want to say, uh, Bishop Joseph, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate you being with us. Um, <laughs> But, but Andy, back 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 to you. Um, and I suppose that you know the Church of England is is currently discussing um, living in love and faith, and um, and um, I suppose the idea that many in the Church of England will feel that um, the Anglican Communion should have a say yes. in in choosing the person who is ultimately responsible for for steering discussions like that through and deciding whether or not there are changes to uh, whether same sex marriages are permitted and all that that that's just uh, that's just not that's just not acceptable in the same way that um the archbishop of canterbury knows that he can't go into um ghana or an, another province and say um you can't say that or you you mustn't do that um people in england might feel well we can't have people coming and saying we can't do something um so yeah well just just a quick quick response to that i think um uh bishop joseph talked about being a family and uh, if we are a family um uh then um the important thing is to keep talking to keep talking to each other um and i think um I mean, I guess that would be one one point that uh, if you have very serious disagreements, um, you can either say, well, actually, the disagreements are too big, they're too wide to bridge, and there there then effectively is some kind of differentiation or separation, which is already happening, and I think we need to recognise that. Um, but but also um, there can be a continued dialogue, and I think it's important, especially for people in the West. Um, that they may hear things being said which seem absolutely outrageous, um, but the continued dialogue is important. And that's one of the things that living in love and faith is about, to be able to hear another point of view. Mm. But um, continued dialogue at the Lambeth Conference, which won't happen because uh, many of the bishops are staying away. Yes, and, that, and I think that's because some people have, made it, have, made, have, made, have come to the conclusion that um, they haven't been heard and they're not going to be heard, and the process is going to be managed in such a way that they're not being heard. Now, I'm not saying whether that view is right or wrong. That is the reality that how many people feel, um, and, and, uh, but within those who are still staying in, if you like, um, it's important to keep, to keep the, the dialogue open. And um, I, guess, I guess that's, I mean, it, it, in a sense, we're, we're moving away from the topic of, of choosing the Archbishop of Canterbury, but um, you know, because I mean, there are big, big, uh, big divisions on these issues, uh, and um, yeah, in a sense, um, uh, I, I, yes, I mean, uh, I, I think it is good to have different different viewpoints, but at the end of the day, um, someone has to make the decision on, on which way to go, and that's that's where the difficulty comes. Um. I want to go to um, it, people who would, if you want to continue to, if you want to um, contribute, please just sort of put your hand up or say in the chat box that you'd like to come in again and I'll try and bring you in. But I want to go now um, to Mark Michael, who's the editor of Living Church, which is an Anglican journal based in the States. Um, Mark, you're in touch with people from all over the communion. Um, I just wonder what your reflections are on, on what you've heard both here and um, from your associates worldwide. First of all, thank you for inviting me to take part. 
um, it bears saying that uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is a very different role from the primates in any of our other uh, Anglican provinces around the world, in part because uh, the church is not established in any of these other places, and Anglicans are very much a, a minority faith. I guess maybe Kenya or Uganda would have a still a, a very significant Anglican population, but, but the sense that when the Archbishop of Canterbury speaks on a religious matter within England, uh, kind of all heads turn. I'm sure it's not as much the case now as it was in the past, but there's not a comparable role, I think, for the primate of any other province. Um, and then another thing is just that in many provinces, including uh, the, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Canada, we actually separated the role of being the primate of the church from being a diocesan bishop a long time ago. We, those roles have been separated in the U.S., in our Episcopal Church since 1938, um, recognizing the complexity of that role. So it's, um, you know, and I think also people in other parts of the communion just don't really understand how the Archbishop of Canterbury is chosen. I mean, when I've talked to people about this in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, I think there's still people who think, you know, somebody brings the prime minister, you know, two names on a, on a silver platter in a smoke-filled room and he, and he you know, throws the dice and see what comes up. So, so there's a degree of, of education that needs to happen as part of this process. Um, I think views, you know, there are some, one thing that's not been mentioned is, um, you know, there are some places where uh, there is a desire to kind of enrich the churchliness. So this has to do maybe with what uh, Bishop Joseph was saying about the church as a family, the idea that we are mutually accountable to one another, that we should make decisions that require sacrifice of, of conscience, you know, being willing to, to take those seriously. Uh, what the Windsor uh, Continuation Group in 2008 famously called an ecclesial deficit within the communion, and that sort of structural steps um, should be taken to, to remedy that deficit. I look back at that report last night, it actually has recommendations about how to restructure the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury to achieve that. Um, this is not one of them, incidentally, but, but it is sort of in the spirit of the kinds of things that are intended so that the, the, the role of the uh, leader of the Anglican Communion uh, in the Archbishop of Canterbury's job description could be more significant and um, the focus could be placed there that is really, really needed. Um, it's, it's my impression that the Archbishop of Canterbury as a leader, um, as a symbol of unity, probably matters the most in the provinces that are most marginal. So I think particularly of the visits the Archbishop of Canterbury made in the last couple of years to Egypt, where um, the church is under a great deal of difficulty just in having recognition of its independence and its ability to manage its own affairs. Lots of high profile meetings when he arrived in Egypt, press conferences that were well attended. Similarly, when he went to Pakistan uh, three years ago, um, lots and lots of attention. These are places where um, these are patriarchal societies um, in, with a pretty kind of robust colonial heritage where the Archbishop of Canterbury's presence carry some weight that the people on the ground really need. Um, I think in provinces where uh, the church is wealthy and successful, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury shows up, it's a nice photo op, but there's not a sense in which people are waiting and they need his voice. I, that bears reflection. I mean, it does sort of remind me of, of uh, you know, we've been reading First Corinthians in the Sunday lectionary, uh, you know, who can say, I have no need of you? Um, well, it's the wealthy provinces that, that sort of, you know, pr privilege autonomy who can say, I have no need of you. Um, those who are really dependent, uh, the, the weaker brothers, they really need a stronger leader and they want to be invested in that process. Uh, I also would say that uh, when, as I've talked to people, uh, they have said to me, well, you know, um, we wanted to have a Lambeth conference back in the 19th century and the Church of England was the one who had no interest in it. Uh, you know, the covenant was advanced, adopted by, I don't know, a dozen provinces, but once general, the General Synod failed to act on it, it was clear there would be no covenant. Um, I think there is a sense, you know, with respect that if the ecclesial deficit in the Anglican Communion is to be remedied, um, if we are to become a more churchly body, it's in a significant sense dependent on how 
how much of its own authority the Church of England is willing to give up, how much it's willing to allow the rest of the communion to have a proper role or a fuller role in, 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 in being accountable to it. I mean, it's, it's sometimes from the outside, it feels a bit like, you know, your mother is getting older and older. Um, and at what point do the children step in and start making some more of the decisions? That's a fraught process in everyday life. Um, and, you know, I wonder if this, this is a small step. Charlie's right, it's a small step. It, maybe it's just a merely symbolic step. But the fact that a lot of people in the Church of England are really pushing back against it, I think, is also uh, revealing. And I think, I think Charlie, you want to come back in. Yeah, I mean, thanks so much. I, I, I think there is a pushback, although I'm not sure the pushback comes from a perspective of wanting to retain more power necessarily, albeit those things are always uh, conscious and unconscious. Um, I mean, I suppose for me, the, the really key thing that's been said is that the views will be in the room. And I think that is true. I think that's an improvement in a sense that we will at least have um, views in the room. Although I do wonder how five strangely selected um, and unclearly selected and unclearly either primates, uh, bishops, clergy, laity, how they will be the uh, representative voice in the room. But nonetheless, I can see the benefit of that. For me, though, the Archbishop of Canterbury will still ultimately be of the English context. And that, for me, is still problematic, I think. Um, and I think... I. I picking up exactly on what Mark said, maybe the Church of England does need to give up some of their authority. Um, and, and But I don't think that can be done by then still electing an English bishop to be the head of the Anglican, the leader of the Anglican communion. Um, and, and I think also if the Church of England did lose this authority, which I'm not sure is always welcome from the Anglican Church's, uh, from the Church of England's perspective, I think they might regain some of their integrity as well and some of the questions of uh, that, that we've talked about today in terms of sexuality, women's leadership and so on. I think the Church of England has not been able to speak in the same way that it would like in some of these things because the Archbishop of Canterbury feels the need to be the leader of the communion. So I think it could be beneficial for everyone if those two things were dislodged from one another. Thank you very much. Um, now, does anybody else want a last word? Um, otherwise, I'm proposing that we go off and get some lunch. Um, Thank you all so much for being here. As I say, this will be going up on the YouTube channel. Um, the discussions will be going on at Synod next week, and we may well, I'm sure at some point, we'll be returning uh, to the to the conversation. And you heard it from Ian Paul, that the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to be retiring in the next four years. I didn't know that. Who did? Maybe he doesn't either. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.